Hello. Right, have I rejoined the meeting? You have, Councillor Lawton. We've just gone live on YouTube. Councillor Brady was about to begin, so you're all set to go. Well, with Councillor Brady's permission, I can take control again. No, I've um, totally lost the connection and I've done the troubleshooting and it's uh, unable to identify uh, uh, an IP configuration. So I'll just have to try and contact this uh, on my telephone. Can I first of all say good morning and welcome to the first meeting of North Tyneside Council's Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Frank Lott and I'm the Chair of the Planning Committee. This meeting is being streamed live on the Council's YouTube channel to enable members of the press and public to observe the meeting and I welcome anyone who is watching. Before we move on to the agenda, I would first like to make it clear who's participating in the meeting and explain how we intend to conduct the meeting. In order to check who's in the meeting, I'd like to ask everyone present to confirm their attendance. Um, and in order to do this, I'll now call out the names of the members of the committee. After I call your name, could you please switch on your microphone and your and introduce yourself so that we can be sure that you can be seen and heard. So I'll go through the list now. Councillor Ken Barry. Hello, Frank. Yes, I'm at the meeting, but my camera doesn't work. OK, Councillor Trish Brady. Present, thanks. Councillor Brian Verdes. Councillor Linda Dahl. Yes, I'm here, Frank. Someone trying to contact me. Um, I think I heard Councillor Linda out there. Councillor Sandra Graham. President Correct Chair. Morning, Councillor Muriel Green. Muriel, are you here? Councillor Paul Richardson. Um, I'm here, Frank. I, I've got Good my morning. own. I've got my own computer, so it's. Um, I have to attract you by the uh, going live anyway. So I'm here, present and correct. Thank you, Councillor Paul Richardson. Yes. Good morning. I'm here. Councillor Sterling. Councillor Francis Wheatman. Hello, yes, I'm here. OK, thank you. We also um, have Councillor Samuel, Chair. And Councillor Samuel, did I miss Councillor Samuel? You did, Frank, but I'm here. I beg your pardon, it's because I'm reading the list of my own computer and you'd slipped above the line whereby you became invisible. Right, we'll continue now um, because with us are the following officers. I'll invite them to introduce themselves. Um, officers, after I call your name, please turn on your microphone and camera and introduce yourself. Julie Lawson. Hello, I'm Julie Lawson. I'm one of the principal officers in the planning department. Aidan Dobinson Booth. Chair, we understand Aidan's having difficulty connecting with the meeting. He's not alone in uh, Dave McCall. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm Dave McCall. I'm the Highways Officer. Thank you. Claire Wilson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Claire Wilson here for Environmental Health. Tessa Crow. Good morning, Chair. I'm here. I'm the legal advisor to the planning committee. Thank you. Thank you. Michael. Good morning, everybody. Michael Robson Clock to the committee. I'm pleased you're still here. And Dave Brown. Morning, Chair and members. Uh, I'm Dave Brown from Democratic Services, giving support to Michael this morning. Good morning. 
everyone, will have been sent guidance notes on how this meeting is to be conducted using the Teams software to ensure that the meeting runs smoothly. <laughs> it's a bit of irony there. Can I remind participants to please turn off your microphone and your camera when you're not speaking? Only speak when you're invited to do so, or in Muriel's case, when you when you need to speak. Um, to do so, activate your microphone and camera just before speaking. Please state your name before speaking. That just helps us identify who it is. If referring to any specific points in a report, please specify the page number and the paragraph number if possible. And if any participants connection to the meeting is lost, uh, I'll adjourn the meeting for a short period of time to allow the connection to be restored. Um, we'll now actually begin with the business of the meeting. We'll as set out in the agenda. Apologies for absence, Michael. Have we any apologies? None that I'm aware of, Chair. OK, thank you. Um, if there are no apologies, presumably there are therefore no substitute members. Again, not that I'm aware of. Thank you. Um, item three, declarations of interest. Can I invite committee members who have any interest? Lay them. There are none. Item four, minutes. Sorry, 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 Frank. I don't know if you can see that. So, sorry, Willie. I, I didn't see your hand. Please um, state your interest. Um, just to say that on the um, item eight, Preston Wood application, I did refer, suggest this refer to committee, but I just want to make it clear I have not prejudged the issue. Um, the fact that it was referred to committee came out of my attempts to have discussions about the the nature of the application, given the level of rep or the representations I've had, but I haven't, I haven't made my mind up about it, so I haven't prejudged it, just to make that clear. Thank you for that statement. Uh, is that recorded, Michael? Thank you, Chair, yes. OK, I didn't for the minutes of the last meeting, which was held on the 17th of March and was circulated with these papers. Can we confirm those as a correct record, please? Agreed. Thank you. Is there any member dissenting from that? Thank you, that's unanimous then. Right, can we now move on to item five, the temporary speaking rights scheme on page nine. Michael, can you introduce the report, please? Thank you. Um, during the period when face-to-face -face meetings are not possible, it is necessary to vary the committee's speaking rights scheme which normally allows objectors or supporters of major and controversial planning applications to attend meetings and address the committee. Attached as Appendix 1 to the report is a proposed temporary scheme. When members of the public or councillors are granted speaking rights, the temporary scheme will allow the speakers to submit a written statement of no more than 850 words to highlight or expand upon the important points made in their representation. The applicant will be provided with a copy of the statement and given the right to respond in a written statement of no more than 850 words. Um, the clerk to the committee will read out these statements during any remote meetings. Once it is possible to resume face-to-face -face meetings, the temporary scheme will expire and the committee will revert to operating its original scheme. The committee are therefore recommended to approve and adopt with immediate effect the temporary scheme set out in Appendix 1 to the report. Thank you for that. Can I um, ask, does any member have a question or comment, please? SG. Sandra Graham. Sorry, Councillor Graham. Thank you very I'm much. As alert as I used to be. <laughs> I just wondered, was there any consideration given to um, to allow the members of the public to be invited to join the committee to present their um, objections in person, if you like, at the end of a screen? Thank you. Yes, um, that was that option was discussed with chair and deputy chair, but I think the feeling was um, to enable all members of the public to have equal rights to the system, then everyone should be afforded the opportunity to submit written submissions rather than providing the option of joining a remote meeting. Thank you for that, Michael. Certainly it did occur to me that um, certainly the applicants and their representatives would have access to computer equipment, etc. 
whereas not all members of the public would have access to computers. So that, that was the um, the main underlying thoughts behind the decision. Are there any other questions, please? I can't see any raised hands. So can I ask committee um, if they would agree to that? And Michael, just for guidance here, do we need to go through the list of people? Uh, that's your decision, Which, Chair. If, you, if you're should comfortable. I invite, should I invite dissent? Fine, yes. Yeah, if any member disagrees with that uh, recommendation, could they please say so now? There are no dissenters, so that is agreed. Thank you. Can we now move to item six, the planning officers, officers reports on page seven. Um, I think we're asked to to note this. Again, does anyone dissent? In which case we will now move on to item seven, the Flying Scotsman. Chair, I wonder, just in in the absence of Aidan Dobinson Booth, who was to present this report, I wonder if I might suggest that we move on to the Preston Wood application first and allow Aidan more time to join the meeting. That seems like a good idea. Um, mind, he hasn't been able to rejoin as quickly as I did. Uh, in which case, we move on to item eight, Preston Wood. Uh, Julie Lawson, you're going yes. to introduce this. I, I am, yes, and I shall just share my screen now to get the presentation up. So hopefully everyone can see that presentation. Um, the application relates to the garden of an existing residential dwelling on Preston Wood in North Shields. So you can see the red line goes around this entire site. Um, but I'll come on to where the exact location within that site is in a bit. The existing dwelling is number 1A, which is here. That is located on land which was formerly the garden of number one Preston Wood, which is this property here. Uh, just an aerial view here. Um, so the site is at the entrance to Preston Wood where it joins Campbell Place here. Um, on the east side of property 1A, which is this property here, is a detached garage and a garden and a driveway which goes on to Campbell Place. And you can see from the aerial, there are several mature trees within the site, and these are protected by a tree preservation order. We've got a couple of um, what we call 3D images just of the site here. So that shows property 1A, and it shows the detached garage and the proposed dwelling is, is proposed. And I'll come on to the plans in a second. Another view looking from the east. So this is Campbell Place here in Preston Wood. And that shows property 1A with the detached garage and their current access to the site. This plan shows here's property 1A and this is the garage and the application is for a three bedroom residential dwelling. The dwelling would be located to the east of the existing property in this location here. So here's the, the dwelling here. And it's got access from Campbell Place here. And um, also proposed is the creation of a new access from Preston Wood to serve the existing residential property 1A. So that's the proposed new access there. And it'll just take us through some plans. So that's just looking at it in a bit more detail. So that's the existing garage of a neighbouring property. Um, so this is the proposed dwelling here with the access from Campbell Place and a new access for the property 1A, which is just off picture with their existing garage there. That shows the floor layout and um, it's a three bedroom property. And I'll just take an each elevation in turn just for, for clarity. So that's the south facing elevation which would face onto Preston Wood and that's west facing elevation. That's the east facing elevation onto Campbell Place and that's the north facing elevation. And that's just a section, section through, which is facing onto Campbell Place, which shows the proposed dwelling and the existing property to the north on Campbell Place. In total, we've had 11 objections from 10 addresses um, with the reasons set out in the agenda. The main issues for members to consider in this case relate to the principle, the impact on the living conditions of surrounding occupiers, 
at the residential environment for future occupiers of the proposed property, the impact on the character and appearance of the site and its surroundings, whether sufficient car parking and access is provided and impact on trees and biodiversity. Take us back just to the aerial view. Uh, probably this one and um, you can see that the site is located so this is the site of the proposed house here with that neighboring property here with the garage there and um, the res the site is in a residential area and it's close to existing amenities and the principle of the development is considered to be acceptable the development will contribute to meeting the housing needs of the borough and in terms of impact on existing residents and future occupiers you can see that the house the site here is surrounded by existing residential properties on all sides. Take us on to the site plan. The dwelling would be located adjacent to the garage of the neighbouring property to the north, which is to Cambo Place. And you can see that the rear building line here, um, it's stepped so that the section closest to the shared boundary respects the rear building line of that property to the north, number two. Um, and then it steps out here, which is at a distance of just over four metres from the boundary. It steps out four metres beyond the rear elevation of number two. Yeah, and um, no windows are proposed in that north elevation and the impact on the residential amenity of number two is considered to be acceptable. And um, in terms of the impact of properties on Hartburn Road, which is take us back onto the aerial, that's these properties here. So the site is here and that's these properties running along here. Um, the impact is considered to be acceptable, given the position of the proposed dwelling here in relation to those properties and the absence of windows in that northern. And the proposed dwelling will be located to the east of the existing property, which is 1A Preston Wood. The ground and first floor windows are proposed in the west elevation of the development, and the impact on the windows in 1A Preston Wood is considered to be acceptable, given that there would be a distance of approximately 22 metres between the two properties. The proposed rear dormer windows overlook one is driveway um, and the main and it wouldn't impact on the main amenity space as this is located on the west side of one A. And there are existing residential properties to the south, which you can see there again due to the distance between the proposed dwelling and those properties, the impact on amenity of those properties is considered to be acceptable. In terms of the proposal itself, the proposal meets the current council's policy on housing standards and a garden will be provided within the property and so there are garden areas so it's officer advice that the impact on amenity is acceptable in terms of the um, character and appearance of the property the dwelling is located on a relatively small plot when compared to the existing property um, 1A and others on Preston Wood. It's not considered that it would result in any significant harm, however. The building would be set back from the boundaries with Preston Wood and Cambo Place by approximately five and a half metres and 7.6 metres along there. So it's considered to be um, acceptable in that, in that regard. In terms of the design of the dwelling, I'll just take us through the elevations. The dwelling is located adjacent to a single storey property at, at two Cambo Place. And um, the proposed dwelling, as you can see, is two storeys. Um, and so we've got this section here which shows the, the proposed property, the east elevation adjacent to the existing property at number two. Um, the eaves are higher than the adjacent property, but the ridge line would sit only 0.2 metres above number two at its highest point. And there are numerous two storey properties on Hartburn Road and Preston Wood, and the height of the dwelling is considered to be acceptable and appropriate for its location. The applicant has stated that the property will be finished in grey render with grey roof tiles. The use of some render is considered to be acceptable in principle, but given that the area is characterised by brick properties, it's officer opinion that brick should also be included in the construction materials. It's considered that the development is well designed to sit comfortably within the site and it relates well to the surrounding buildings and conditions are recommended for materials. And um, taking us back to the site plan. Yeah, the dwelling would be provided with a carport and driveway, which is, as I've said, access from Campbell Place. And there's the new access proposed from Preston Wood. The highways network manager states that an appropriate level of parking has been provided for the existing and proposed dwelling and recommends conditional approval. Um, one of the key plans, and you can just see on here, is the impact, key issues, is the impact on the existing trees at the site. Now, if I just show what you can see there, so 
The proposed dwelling is located in this area and you can see these trees here, which are protected by a tree preservation order. Just you can see them there and they're, they're indicated on this plan, but on another plan that I'm going to come on to in a second. So those trees are protected by a TPO along the southern boundary of the site that obviously highly prominent in the street scene. Um, the proposed dwelling and driveway alterations would be located in close proximity to these trees. It's not intended to remove any of these trees to construct the development, although two smaller, more recently planted trees located centrally within the site would need to be removed. Now, the applicant has submitted um, a, a lot of information in relation to the arboricultural assessment um, in terms of the impact of the proposed dwelling on these trees. And it would be the dwelling would be located within one metre of one of the sycamore trees. Part of the consideration is the impact, obviously, of the dwelling on, on those trees and to allow the construction to take place without harming the tree. It's proposed to build the foundations on the same line as the original garden wall that was at the site. So currently the wall is along the frontage here, but there was a wall, as you can see from this street view image um, set into the site. And um, so that using mini piles and a ring beam foundation design. Special working methods would need to be adopted within the root protection area of the trees and also to reduce to prune the trees as a result of any overshadowing. The south elevation of the dwelling does not contain any habitable windows and the landscape architects comments are set out in the agenda and um, she states that the impact on the retained trees would be minimal subject to the work being carried out in accordance with the supporting information and she set out a series of conditions to ensure that the trees are adequately protected and that includes the provision of two new trees to replace those smaller trees from within the site we set out the comments of the biodiversity officer who requires a condition regarding a bat method statement and the developer has agreed to pay 337 pounds towards coastal mitigation in conclusion, the applicant, the application site is within a built up area in close proximity to local services. It will provide an additional residential unit in a sustainable location opinion. It's acceptable subject to the coastal mitigation section 106 and expiry of the consultation period, which is tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Um, can I now invite questions from any members? Councillor Brady. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank, thanks, Julie. I, I've got two questions. Uh, one is in relating to, uh, I understand that there's quite a lot of uh, information there about the construction and protecting the trees, but I'm just wondering about the proximity of those trees to the final dwelling, uh, not necessarily the roots, but overhanging the roof. Um, and the second thing is in relation to the hard standing for the existing dwelling and for the new dwelling, are there any conditions relating to the permeability of that, or the construction of it? Thank you. Thank you. I will just have a check in terms of the conditions. Um, but in terms of your first question about the, the need for pruning, that is covered in um, some of the arboricultural information that's been submitted by the applicant. Um, I think one of the reports refers to the need to trim some branches off one of the trees, which is referred to as T1, but it refers to the removal of only minor twigs. And I was just trying to find the landscape comments because I believe they're referred to in that um, as well. Um, the landscape architect is satisfied with the, with the level of um, work that would need to be undertaken at the site. And as I say, it has been covered in one of the arboricultural submissions by the applicant. And um, in terms of the conditions, um, let's, sorry, I'm just reading the conditions. Sorry, can you just repeat the second element of your question? I'm just looking at the conditions whilst whilst you do. Um, the second part of the question was in relation to the hard and whether that was there was a condition there about permeability. Thank you. I shall I shall just have a check um, on that. Julie, while you're checking on that, yes. I've noticed that Trish Brady. Oh, sorry, no, carry on. That, that's that's fine. Carry on.
Sorry, I was just looking for a condition about um, the, what would would normally put on in terms of the materials and the construction materials. Um, because what I was thinking is we could add those details. We would normally put those details. Yes, condition 12 refers to samples of materials and finishes for the development and surfaces must be submitted to and approved by the local planning authority. So whilst it doesn't set out about permeability, it does um, ask for information on not just the construction of materials for the actual house, but the surfacing materials as well for the property. Right, is, is that OK, Teddy? OK, thank you. I mean, I, I would ask that we do um, impose some condition around permeability just in relation to, to flooding aspects. OK, thank you. I've now got three speakers, I understand. Can I bring Councillor Samuel in? Yes, I think, uh, I think to be honest, my, my Councillor Beatty covered the question I was about to ask, which is just in relation to the proximity to the, the existing the existing trees to the development and uh, the likelihood that they would be damaged in any way during the construction of the building, which I think is more or less being covered. But um, if there's any kind of um, further comments on just the uh, how, how the trees would that survive this process, which is which I'm I remain unconvinced about. I'd be welcome. I'd be interested to hear them. OK, um, Julie, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, I just in terms of the conditions that obviously the landscape architects commented fully on um, the information that's been submitted by the applicant. And um, what I'd also state is that the, the landscape architect has recommended a condition which we've in turn recommended. Um, which requires an arboricultural consultant to be appointed um, to advise on tree management for the site and to undertake regular supervision visits to oversee the agreed tree protection measures and any unexpected works that could affect the tree trees and we'd require written evidence of that monitoring as well so that that's an additional person um, on site just in terms of the trees but we've also put conditions on about like in terms of the foundations and that element of the construction as well. So we, we have put a lot of conditions on, recommended a lot of conditions in terms of tree protection, because obviously, as we say, that is one of the key issues for for this for this proposal. OK, thank you. Can I bring in Councillor Ken Barry? Uh, Councillor Ken Barry, just just a question on the, the two trees that are actually uh, being removed. Uh, and supposedly replaced. I get where they're going to replace them because I can't see there's much site left to put uh, these trees back in. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Yes, those two. I'm just going to share my screen so I can get the presentation back up as well because this this might help um, answer answer your query. Um, let me just there. That's probably best. So the application, the house as proposed is over here but the application site extends to all of this area here which includes the existing dwelling and the two trees that were planted within the site were as a result of this proposal here and um, so they'd be able to be planted within any of this wider area as well within the site not just within this site here so th there would be scope plenty scope to to find along those two trees within within that wider area, which which would satisfy the requirements of the landscape architect. OK, thank you. Can I bring in Councillor Burgess? Thank you, Frank. Uh, again, it's about the trees. Again, it's about the trees. Although the trunk of the tree appears to be one metre away from the proposed building, what about the overhang? I know there's no uh, windows on the back, but the overhang of the trees will still, those branches will still be hitting the tiles, I suspect. And what is to stop the people deciding whoever moves into that house in the future to com start complaining that the actual branches are hitting the tiles and they need to prune or cut down the tree? That's it. That, thank you. Yeah, in terms of your latter point, um, any any additional pruning works would require consent from the local authority because the tree is covered by a, a tree preservation order. Um, I was just trying to find um, some of the actual information that 
the applicants had submitted. Um, so I could try and at least show you show you that. Um, the applicants have submitted information on what works they consider will be required to the trees, to the tree. Um, find it. Um, it had just included, but it did say, as I said earlier, um, it mentioned the crown raising of T1, but it was achievable, it says, and this was the words in the report, with only the removal of minor twigs. And our landscape architect has seen these reports and considered it to be acceptable. Um, so as I say, they have submitted quite a few um, supporting information. And if I can find any more information just now, I will try and do that. Um, Ah, yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's actually, that's, as I've said, they've referred to crown lifting is only necessary to one of the sycamore trees. The extent of the works proposed is well, referred to another report is detailed by our culturalist. So that's that's in another report. Um, let's try and find that. Um, but that's what I read that it was they didn't believe that they would need much pruning to that particular tree and as I say our landscape architect has seen that information as well and is satisfied with that if I can find any more information I will let you know <laughs> so I'll just yeah. have a further quick check okay thanks very much thank you councillor Samuel your hands raised again or is it just from the previous time when you spoke Sorry, Frank. I imagined that um, somebody else mysteriously would take the hand down, but I'll try and do that now. All oh, right. Does any member wish to ask a further question? In that case, can I invite comments from members, please? Councillor Samuel. Yeah, that's my hand up again. Sorry to the confusion about that. Um, yes, just to say really, I think um, I've listened to what's being said. I still feel unconvinced uh, about the potential damage to the trees. And therefore, as things stand, I am now minded to oppose this application. Um, I'm not saying that perhaps another application might be more satisfactory. It would, it would certainly protect the trees, but uh, I feel quite strongly about tree preservation orders in general. And we've seen some of these applications that start off by intruding on uh, existing foliage and trees, etc. Then, by stealth, um, the the move the they tend to disappear. I don't. I'm not convinced that um, one extra house is actually going to help the authorities' housing situation particularly well. I'm unconvinced by that kind of counter argument. So that's basically where I stand at this point in time. Thank you, Councillor Barry. Um, I have to agree with Mr. Samuels. Uh, um, I'm going to vote against this because I think this is an erosion of that area. It's gradual. You put in a, a, the original planning application, you had three bungalows, and that was withdrawn because of so much feeling against it. He's built a house on there, which is a large house, and now he's building another one. So I'm not convinced either that he's not going to come back with a third application to fill the other area of the, uh, his garden. I also am a bit concerned that all these driveways and junctions are so close together. Road safety wise, uh, I'm not convinced that's safe. So unfortunately, I'll be voting against this. Thank you, Councillor Brady. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's known to the committee that I do favour the use of these kind of interstitial sites in the longer term to provide housing. However, I do share uh, concerns, particularly those of uh, Councillor Burdis, about the overhang of these trees on a two storey or one and a half storey house. Um, and that is kind of influencing my thinking at the moment. So I'm, I'm inclined to. Um, Go ahead, uh, not approve this uh, application. Thank you, Councillor Burdis. Um, 
Thank you, Frank. Uh, again, I'm agreeing with uh, Brady, uh, Marianne, and Samuel. Uh, I don't think uh, a few twigs will suffice in the long run to keep the, uh, the branches from the roof of that house, even though it's only one and a half storeys. I believe that maybe in a few months, years, they'll be asking to have the thing removed. So I'll be voting against the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 68, the biodiversity officer um, does state that the um, application potentially requires significant pruning work, I think of as a few twigs. So I shall be refusing this. I think we need to protect the trees that are there, the significant trees to the amenity of the area, and I shall be refusing this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Now, I've still got hands up. No, they've gone down now. Um, Councillor Burdis, do you want to speak again? No, I forgot to take the hands down. Okay. Um, well, so far we had uh, expressions uh, opposing this application. Um, I suppose for balance, I'd like to say that um, I'm convinced by paragraph 11.8 on page 56 where the officer summarises that the development is well designed to sit comfortably within the site. I note that this building is no closer to currently built uh, properties. It relates well to the surrounding buildings and so I'll be voting in favour. No other member wish to speak. I'm pausing there to allow people the opportunity. Right, so uh, we'll move to the vote um, and this will be conducted. Michael, can I hand over to you now, please? I'm oh, sorry, the officer recommendation is that the committee indicates it's minded to grant, subject to various conditions, and that um, on completion of the Section 106 agreement that the Head of Housing, Environment and Leisure be granted delegated authority to determine the application. So it's in two parts, but effectively the officer recommendation is to approve. So when we do go to the vote, you'll be asked to vote either for or against. Michael. Thank you, Chair. So I'll just read out members of the committee's names and then if each member could just indicate their vote either for or against. Councillor Barry. I'm against. Councillor Brady. Against. Councillor Burdis. Against. Councillor Dark. Against. Councillor Graham. Against. Councillor Green. Against. Councillor Lott. For. Councillor Richardson. I'm for. Councillor Samuel. Against. And Councillor Wheatman. Against. Chair, we have eight votes against and two votes for. So the application is refused. The application is refused. Can I ask members to um, give us the reasons as to why they believe it should be refused? Councillor Samuel. Yes, Chair, I think as previously stated, it's on the grounds that um, it has on uh, negative impact on the trees in the area and um, we are concerned that um, it would lead to um, further damage um, and breaches of the tree preservation order if that's clear. Thank you. Councillor Brady. Uh, same uh, impact on trees and biodiversity. Thank you. Does any other member wish to express their reasons as to why they've refused it? There are no hands going up. Can I ask the officer, is that satisfactory? Yes, I have everything I need, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, that application is therefore refused. Can I ask, is Aidan Dobinson both with us now? 
Uh, good morning, Chair, uh, and good morning, members of the committee. Um, I am here. Uh, apologies uh, that I wasn't here. First thing I've, if you look at the um, the thing on the bottom, I'm actually using my wife's laptop, uh, which is sort of uh, coming to the, in terms of the breach uh, to help me out. Is my laptop is unfortunately uh, only fit for recycling now. <laughs> okay, Aidan, thank you very much for joining us. And could you lead us into item seven, the Flying Scotsman? Yes, uh, of course. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm just going to share my uh, screen, so hopefully you can follow the, um, the 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 presentation that was was sent previously. Just bear with me one moment. Sorry about this, just bear with me on one moment. I'll just try again. Let me know if you want me to get the presentation up and just go through it yeah. whilst you're presenting. Thanks, Judy. Yeah, I can't see it in my in my oh there it is. Okay, brilliant. Right. Slide show. Right. Um, can slide, okay. Right, hopefully. Um, members should be able to see that in terms of the, uh, the title page. So yes, this is um, item seven uh, for the Flying Scotsman, uh, Briar Edge uh, Forest Hall. The uh, application site is an existing public house, and it's indicated there in terms of the uh, the, the, the red the red dot. And this is the uh, the public house itself here. Uh, you've got the the main road running through here. You've got Forest Hall. District Centre along here. You've got an existing um, surface level car park at this point, and you've got the East Coast Main Line uh, running just to the the south there. There's a pedestrian footbridge as well that uh, is is again to the to the south, and um, also members will note that it is a uh, a mixed area as there are um, nearby uh, residential uh, properties to both to the other side of the. Uh, the railway line you'll hear from a speaker in due course uh, in terms of that, but also other um, residential properties close by as well. OK, planning permission uh, is sought for the formation of a roof terrace, beer garden, construction of a timber framed covered seating area, external stair access, ground level. The main issue for members to consider, therefore, is the impact on visual and residential amenity. In total, there have been 11 uh, objections and 33 letters of support. Now, moving to the issue of amenity, members need to balance the economic and community benefits of the proposal against the impacts in terms of residential and visual amenity. This is just showing a, a, a site plan of the proposal. It's probably better if I go to the, the next one, you can see it in, in, in more detail. So you can see there, the, uh, this is the, the north point. So we're dealing with the, um, the, the raised element of the, the southwest, southwest part uh, of the uh, existing uh, flat, flat roof of the building. Um, the proposed terrace would include a deck surface glazed edge balustrade and horizontal timber screening. The glazed balustrade would be uh, to this part here, facing towards the, uh, the railway tracks, uh, and the wooden element would be uh, to the front here. It would also be recessed somewhere, approximately six metres from the, uh, the front of the, the, the building at this particular point here. Uh, 
Uh, external seating and tables will be at low level and a timber framed covered area will be located next to the existing two story section of the building, uh, which is which is that part there. And again, if I just take you through some of the, the plans. So this is the um, this is the roof terrace with the tables there. This is the, um, the, the covered area. Again, just another plan there and you can see this is the um, existing existing front and this would be the proposed with the timber screening there and the other side this is the existing of the rear so this is the view that the residents would see from the other side of the uh, railway tracks looking towards it and this is the proposed you can see there's the um, there's the glazed, glazed balustrade uh, to the rear and there's the uh, the wooden uh, the wooden screens in terms of uh, towards the towards the front. The um, existing public house is located in a mixed uh, use area of Forest Hall. Uh, three Benton View, which is the uh, speaker that you hear from shortly, and Mrs Adamson, uh, is sited approximately 40 metres away to the southwest. The proposed development will be sited over part of the existing single storey flat roof, the part which is closest to the railway track. It will be set back from the road to the northeast of the public house. The windows serving habitable rooms to surrounding properties do not afford direct views of the public house, although there would be obscure views. More direct views would be afforded from some of the residential gardens located to the west and south of the site. And again, if I just go back to the aerial view, you get a better idea here. So this is where the uh, where, where, the, where the terrace where the terrace would be. Uh, there would be distant views of the proposed development over garden areas of the neighbouring properties to the west and southwest. However, due to the separation distance of approximately uh, 40 metres, officers consider that neighbours would not be affected. The objections received regarding the impacts on neighbouring properties in terms of noise, disturbance and antisocial behaviour are noted. The manager of environmental health has been consulted. She considered that the submitted acoustic report uh, and she does not agree with its findings that the external terrace would not give rise to adverse noise impacts for neighbouring residents if allowed to operate until late into the evening. She advised that it's not anonymous noise like passing traffic, which is less intrusive. The applicant wants to use the roof terrace until 11 p.m. Monday to Friday, midnight on Saturdays, and 10.30 p.m. on Sundays and bank holidays. The Manager of Environmental Health has said that allowing the use of the roof terrace until these times would give rise to significant adverse impacts for neighbouring residents from associated customer noise. The Manager of Environmental Health recommends limiting the use of the roof terrace until 9 p.m. in the evening. Subject to this is officer advice that the impacts arising from the noise could be controlled. Officers also consider that a further condition is required to increase the height of the glass balustrade. So that would be uh, at this particular point, uh, point here, two metres in height, which would further help reduce the impact in terms of residential amenity for these residential occupiers beyond the railway lines. In terms of other issues, uh, it's officer advice that issues such as biodiversity, car parking, access, contaminated land, rail and aviation safety are all considered to be acceptable subject to conditions. In conclusion, members need to determine development is acceptable by balancing the benefits of the proposal against its impacts. It is the view of officers that subject to conditions that the proposed development is acceptable. It's therefore recommended that planning permission is granted subject to conditions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Aidan. Now, before we move to members' questions, we've um, we've got under the new temporary speaking rights scheme, a Mrs. Jennifer Adamson of Laurel Avenue and Forest Hall has been granted permission to uh, to submit a written statement to the committee, which uh, Michael will now read out. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Jennifer Adamson and I live in one of the houses just across the step bridge to the south of the Flying Scotsman. I objected to the planning application and I would like to thank the chair for giving me the opportunity to submit this statement. I am very disappointed that the planning officer has recommended approval as I think the proposed roof terrace beer garden will have a detrimental impact on the local area. 
My first concern is its visual impact. Materials are proposed. Timber panelling and pergola, corrugated metal sheeting covering the pergola and part of one of the new stairways, metal stairways, glazed panelling with chrome balustrade and Victorian style lamps. I think the use of these modern, old and industrial style materials will give a haphazard appearance to the proposed development, which will not tie in well with the existing pub. Due to the first floor nature of the development, it will, it will be clearly visible, especially from within the Forest Hall shopping area and by pedestrians using the step bridge. And I consider that its appearance will be visually harmful to the area. This would be contrary to the recent works to improve the shopping area with various street works and the conversion of living house to flats. Due to distance and orientation, I do accept that the proposed alterations will not greatly impact on the outlook or privacy from my house and garden. However, the same cannot be said for 109 Station Road, where the garden immediately abuts the railway line and it will be overlooked, resulting in loss of visual amenity and privacy for the resident. I'm pleased that the Council's Environmental Health Manager does not accept the conclusions in the applicant's noise assessment and considers that there will be adverse noise impacts for neighbouring residents. However, I do not consider that the proposed planning condition to restrict the use of the roof terrace to 9pm adequately overcomes the noise problem. It's on nice summery days when the roof terrace will be most popular and it is on these days especially that residents also want to enjoy being in their gardens. I consider noise generated prior to 9pm could make this intolerable. I have lived in my house for about 40 years and during this time have had some disturbance from noise coming from the Flying Scotsman, with this occurring most frequently and regularly in the last two to three years. Noise from the existing smoking area on the south east can start at about lunchtime, generally as gentle chatter, but by late afternoon and early evening to a disturbing level and by night to an overwhelming level. This smoking area contains four bench seats with a capacity of about 20 people. It is also at ground floor level. I consider that the noise from up to 84 people in the proposed first floor roof terrace could be at very high levels from mid-afternoon onwards, making it unacceptable for occupiers of nearby houses. I think the applicant's request for the roof terrace to be open until 1 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays his disregard for the amenity of nearby residents. Nowhere in his application can I find mention of the condition on the planning consent for the existing smoking area, which states, the proposed external drinking area shall only be used between the hours of 0800 hours and 2100 a.m. After 2100 hours, customers shall be permitted to stand in the smoking area for smoking purposes only. And the reason for that is in order to protect the amenity of occupiers of nearby properties having regard to policies E3 and H13 of the Development Plan 2002. I have contacted both the Council's planning and environmental health departments about the breach of this planning the noise generated from the area. Customers regularly drink in this area after 9pm without, it would seem, any action being taken by the public. I think that there could also be non-compliance with the proposed similarly worded Condition 3 recommended in the officer's report for the roof terrace. I think it would be difficult for the publican to require his customers to vacate the roof terrace by 9pm every evening and also for the council to monitor and enforce compliance with this condition. It is thereby an unenforceable and inappropriate planning condition. During the last few weeks, I have got used to hearing birdsong in my garden. Regardless, living in an urban area, I do accept that there will be noise generated from surrounding activities. However, I think the noise that will come from the proposed roof terrace on the Flying Scotsman Public House will be beyond an acceptable level. I therefore urge members to refuse the planning application on grounds of noise disturbance to nearby residents, unacceptable visual impact in local area and overlooking loss of privacy to adjacent occupier. Thank you for listening to my statement. Thank you, Michael. Now, just for the record, uh, Mr. Wilson of Benton View Forest Hall um, had also been invited to submit a written statement, uh, 
but he hasn't responded to that invitation. No statement's been received. Now, Mr. Andrew Lorimer of Wakefield's Chartered Building Surveyors has submitted a written statement in response to Mrs. Adamson's statement. Um, on behalf of the applicants, Punch Tabins, and I'll now invite Michael to read out Mr. Lorimer's statement. Thank you, Chair. Just before I do, just to correct one error, I think in your notes, um, Mrs. Adamson is actually a resident of Benton View and Mr. Wilson is a resident of Laurel Avenue. I think that's got mixed up in your notes. Um, so this is the statement from Mr. Lorimer. We acknowledge and have carefully considered the objections raised in the statement submitted by Jennifer Adamson. We have also fully reviewed the planning officer's report, which we feel is comprehensive, fair and well balanced, taking all aspects into detailed account and presents a robust conclusion in line with planning policies and guidelines. As such, it is not our intention to reiterate or take up the members' time covering points which we have already been made in the planning officer's report or documentation we have provided. We will merely highlight some pertinent points which we feel are relevant at this juncture. It is clear that there is a considerable amount of support, both via letters and online comments submitted during the process, which highlights a number of positive factors which this proposed development would bring, such as employment, continued viability of the establishment and facility to the locality and surrounding area. This is even more pertinent now than before, given the COVID-19 situation and the awareness that certain ways of living and operating will change for the feasible future. Therefore, external spaces and the ability to maintain greater distances between people is more important and pubs are in a position where significant changes must be made if they are to remain viable. It is also a considerable risk that failure to be able to adapt could lead to the loss of many drinking establishments, which has negative impacts upon the local economy and employment. Looking beyond the COVID-19 situation, we are mindful of local residents and their enjoyment of their homes and gardens. It is for these reasons that the applicants and managers of the Flying Scotsman are wholeheartedly committed to ensuring the sensible conditions and restrictions proposed by the planning officer's report are accepted and adhered to. However, respectfully, we do feel the objections raised are largely matters of opinion and not reinforced with evidence which would give reasonable grounds for refusal under current planning policies and guidelines. This opinion also appears to be reinforced by the content and recommendation of the planning officer's report. The visual aspects of the objections are once again a matter of opinion, and it would appear that the general consensus to the design is favourable, particularly considering the lack of character or visual merit afforded by the current arrangement of the proposed location of the roof terrace. The design has been carefully considered and created to be respectful to the existing streetscape and surrounding area, whilst also enhancing the existing structure and incorporating features which tie into the character of the adjacent rail line and the Flying Scotsman heritage itself. The noise restrictions would be fervently managed and respected. The light levels are carefully designed and will be fastidiously implemented and the ecological elements and conditions will be adhered to in their entirety, as would all conditions. It is considered that all reasonable considerations have been made in the design and proposed scheme to ensure it is in line with planning policies and guidelines. The applicants have accepted without question the proposed conditions, which we agree are simple, entirely logical, and feel the planning officer's report is both comprehensive and accurate. We thank the members for their time and consideration and hope they will agree with the planning officer's recommendation to grant approval. Thank you, Michael. Um, it's now the opportunity for members to, to ask questions. And if, if I can begin with one, um, Mr. Lorimer in his presentation speaks about the consequent requirements on public houses to adapt to the, the new norm of um, COVID-19 restrictions. Uh, clearly the planning guidelines that this committee has got to adhere to will not have been constructed taking into account COVID-19. So can I ask Aidan please if that should have any bearing on our decision? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, in terms of coming back, I mean, I, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, 
in terms of the, uh, the the guidance that's come from government at the moment, um, obviously the, the most of the uh, guidance is, is around uh, issues to do with uh, issues to do with public health. Uh, however, what the government has said in terms of a, a written ministerial statement is that um, very much the plan has sort of has to play its part really in terms of um, the helping the the country uh, recover. Uh, from the from the pandemic, um, so I wouldn't attach probably too much weight in terms of COVID per se. However, what I would draw uh, members' attention to is the uh, is the existing advice within MPPF, and that's paragraph eighty, and the need to attach significant weight to uh, proposals for economic development. Now, clearly, this would be a proposal that would um, would would help the public house and would. Enable it to provide a, a better and more comprehensive offer, and therefore it, it, it does provide sort of economic benefits um, to, to to the public house. And obviously, the public house uh, does employ people in terms of wider issues to do with employment. So uh, there there are there are benefits to the proposal, and they need to be sort of given uh, appropriate weight by members and when they make their decision. Thank you. And for members' benefit, that's referenced in paragraph 8.3 on page 25. Can I ask, do, do any members have any questions to ask of Aidan, please? Councillor Brady. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Aidan, for that presentation. Um, my question is in relation to, I mean, I'm impressed by the number of um, objections from local residents in relation to immunity um, disturbance and noise. You know, I have lived next to um, public house and I know that the, these um, can be noisy. However, I'm, I'm, um, I wonder what the, you know, how we do um, enforce these conditions on establishing sure that they're not breached. Can you comment on that, Aidan? Um, yes, of course. Um, thank you, Stuart. Um, in terms of of this, I was doing a bit of uh, prep just before the, uh, the the committee, and uh, Miss Adamson makes re reference to the, the smoking shelter. Uh, existing smoking shelter, uh, which is just immediately to the to the to the south, um, and obviously there's concern in terms of the the operation of, of that. Now, that smoking shelter was permitted in 2015, and we have had complaints that it's been uh, uh, operated out of hours. Now, the most recent investigation um, in terms of our records is 2017. Um, and the owner of the public house was written to to remind them of their responsibilities and their obligations. Um, so that there is uh, there, there is sort of um, some history uh, in terms of this. What I would say is, and, and where I sort of slightly disagree with with Miss Adamson in terms of the enforceability of the condition, um, I think the the condition is suitable. That, for example, the condition as it's framed to allow the roof terrace to open until uh, until 9 p.m. Then, if it's if it opens after 9 p.m., uh, an enforcement officer, if uh, if they went to investigate, could quite clearly see uh, if people were using it, and if they were using it, then uh, suitable enforcement action uh, could be taken. Now, that would normally be in the form of uh, you would normally write to someone to remind them of their obligations under the condition. However, if that wasn't uh, acted upon, uh, you then could serve a, a breach of condition notice. So um, I would say, yes, I'm, I am sympathetic to Mrs. Adamson's uh, concerns. Uh, the condition is suitably precise that we could seek to enforce it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Samuel. Thanks, Chair. Possibly more of an observation than anything else, but I'd be interested in Kevin's comments on it. I mean, uh, many of the need to relate more to licensing matters than uh, planning matters, and I know there's always a bit of an overlap there, um, but um, I think tackling some of the concerns probably calls more than the area of licensing and planning. I just I wonder what you thought. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think you're absolutely right that there is a degree of overlap between uh, issues to con uh, the the concern licensing, but also issues that do concern uh, concern planning. Um, however, it is right that this committee sort of has regard 
to issues to do with noise and disturbance and and visual immunity and we as planning officers feel that by conditioning the uh, the roof terrace to 9 p.m. and also with having that additional uh, height of the glass balustrade along the southern southern boundary facing towards the residential properties that we feel that the the, the sort of right balance uh, will be struck and that's why we feel uh, able to support this particular application. Okay thank you Councillor Green do you have a question? Uh, yes thank you um, there isn't any additional car parking now we all want people to walk to the pubs and, and restaurants and things, but um, is there considered to be sufficient car parking that uh, will potentially come to this uh, development? I think that's for you, Dave. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, ironically, the, um, the, the the current park level is exactly what's required in terms of LDD12. So this sets it slightly over so that the park is actually falls a few um, a few spaces short. Um, I'll just check the check the figures. Uh, it would require uh, 26 spaces, but it's it's actually only plus, plus two disabled spaces. However, being in a local centre, um, you know, with with other parking available within the uh, the, the shopping area, uh, and some restrictions in the surrounding streets, I've, I'm of the view, and that, that what my recommendation is based on, is that the the park will be sufficient for the for the needs of the pub. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Graham. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I do have some experience in my ward of a, a roof terrace pub that, albeit was set up illegally, but has caused a great deal of disturbance for residents in the locality. Um, and I just wonder, setting the limit at 9pm means that people will be drinking and up after that time with the best will in the world i'm sure the landlord will find it difficult to move on people on a nice sunny evening um, i'm wondering if members of the committee would consider an amendment to an earlier time and i throw that out to members of the committee to give time to clear so that um in particular are not disturbed thank you could I ask for Aidan's comments first and foremost on that proposed amendment? Yes, I mean it's obviously it's within the, the gift of the committee to uh, to choose whichever conditions uh, it considers to to be reasonable. Uh, all I would say is that the the current wording of the condition, uh, I'll just read it uh, here. It says the proposed development hereby approved shall only be used between the hours of ten till twenty one hundred on any day. So I, I take the point of, of Councillor Graham because um, you, you can imagine, yes, there's, there's, there's a time, isn't there, when people may be finishing off their drinks before they move back inside. Uh, but I would say that the, um, the, the that condition is very, very clear that it has that the use of that as an external seating area has to cease at 2100 hours. Now, so therefore, it wouldn't be a case of, oh, well, I'm sorry, I've got a drink. I've got it. I've got this drink at five to nine, I'm going to sit and have my drink for the next sort of, I don't know, however long, half an hour, 45 minutes or whatever. It will be a case of, I'm sorry, if you've got your drink at five to nine, you then have to, you'd have to drink it uh, within the within the, the pub itself. You couldn't drink it outside. I think with suitable sort of signage um, and the, the cooperation of the uh, of the landlord, who seems very willing to, to, to cooperate on this particular, uh, particular issue, then that shouldn't be an issue. But yes, it's entirely within members' gift if they think nine o'clock isn't acceptable to suggest an earlier time. Does any other member wish to comment on Councillor Graham's proposed amendment? If, if I could comment, um, I, I would vote against it on the grounds that 9pm is a reasonable time, I think, for drinkers to vacate and also for people who um, are, are going to bed. But it does also occur to me that this is adjacent to a railway track and we're not asking British Rail to stop their trains passing at nine o'clock. Um, does any other member have a comment? Is there a second? Councillor Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, with due respect, the railway track has a train going down every now and again. But the noise and chatter as people have drunk more does get um, 
louder as the time continues. Um, I would respectfully suggest that we um, propose an amendment as a compromise. Right, there's an amendment proposed that uh, we change that condition for uh, for clearing the area to 8 p.m. Um, can I ask, is that seconded? I'm happy to second it. Sorry, I don't have a hands up function. Right, thank you, Councillor Wheatman. That is seconded. Um, does any other member wish to comment? If not, we'll move to the vote on the amendment. Um, and if the amendment is carried, we'll then need to go to a further vote on the actual application. Mm -hmm. Councillor Samuel, you've indicated, and Councillor Richardson. Councillor Samuel. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to appoint and I'll just explain why, because I think, as I said before, and alluded to the kind of connections between licence and 9 p.m. is generally the accepted restriction time for kind of door activities and pubs, etc. Uh, I'm not convinced that this one should be any different. Uh, and also that um, I think um, following on, if this application is granted, come in front of the li a licence will have to be granted. And I think then it's a licence committee that would be able to deal with any breaches of that more effectively, I think, than uh, a planning committee. So for that, we'll afford the amendment. Thank you for that. Councillor Richardson. Um, thank you, Chair. A um, couple of thoughts, one of which um, relates to, to the potential amendment. Um, I was thinking, I, I take your point about the trains and I'd wondered about that. Um, but people, I guess, have chosen to live with that. Um, the nine o'clock proposed deadline makes some sense for some thinking about families and bedtimes. Um, obviously, you know, children under a certain age would go to bed well before that. Um, so, like, and on one level, I don't really see that eight o'clock or nine o'clock makes much difference. My real concern, maybe Kelsey, I'll just touch on it, would be about the enforcement. Because, I don't know, we've all been in, I certainly been in establishments where um, landlords have tried to get people to leave or move or leave quietly or whatever it is without very much success. And I'm sure, um, you know, to paraphrase, they would say that now, wouldn't they? Um, that it'll be adhered to to the letter and fastidiously. Um, but it'd be the enforcement that would be, would be my concern. Thank you, Councillor Samuel, your hand's still up. Do you have a, do you, do you want to have a second comment? No, Chair, I'll take my hand down. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. According to my screen, no one else has indicated that they wish to speak to the amendment. So with Michael's assistance, we'll move to the vote. The um, the amendment is that we change the condition such that this area has to be cleared by 8 p.m. rather than 9 p.m. Councillor Barry. Agreed. That's four, yeah. Councillor Brady. Against. Councillor Burdis. Against. Against. Councillor Graham. No. Councillor Green. Against. Councillor Lott. Against. Councillor Richardson. No. Councillor Samuel. Against. Councillor Sweetman. Four. Chair, that's four votes, four and six against. Okay, so that amendment falls. Um, to be honest, I've forgotten where we were in the proceedings. I thought we were still asking questions. So can I now invite comments on the main application, which now results in the area being cleared at 9 p.m.? So that's the application that we're considering now. The amendment has fallen. Um, any comments on the main application, please? Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have noted uh, with 
a great interest and concern the development in the shopping centre next door to this, that the council has spent a lot of money in that area uh, and upgraded the area. I think this is an imaginative um, uh, initiative that will um, enhance and add to um, the vibrancy of that particular area. Um, it's partially outdoors, it's um, partially indoors. Uh, we've had applications for this particular building before. Um, I think there is enough parking space because it is uh, adjacent to the shopping centre and there's quite a lot uh, in the shopping centre. So I think with the council's initiative and, and this, uh, that it will really make a big improvement in that area. So I'll be voting for it. Thank you, Councillor Richardson. Sorry, Councillor Richardson, I thought you wanted to speak. Councillor Brady. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just to, to echo Councillor Green's um, comments, I, I, I uh, welcome it as, a, as a, um, uh, an economic bonus in the area and uh, an amenity for to use, particularly given that we will probably for some considerable time be looking at different ways to uh, engage in public space, the hospitality sector in particular may struggle over the next little while. Um, and I'm reassured uh, generally about the um, enforcement of restrictions and conditions uh, in relation to planning and um, uh, licensing for this particular um, venture, given that there has been considerable concern from the residents. Um, so I, I will be voting for this. Thank you. No other member has indicated, for, for my part, I'm happy to approve this, um, particularly with regards to the use of materials. And I know that the, the lady who objected to this um, said it looked like a bit of a, a mismatch, but I think the use of some um, traditional uh, artifacts incorporated into the design will be something worth looking at. So I'll be voting for it. Um, are there any other comments from members, please? No one's indicating. So, Michael, can I ask you to conduct the vote, please? The officer recommendation is to approve the application subject to the conditions set out in pages 33 and 34 of our agenda papers. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Barry? Four. Councillor Brady? Four. Councillor Burdis? Four. Councillor Dark? Four. Councillor Graham? Four. Councillor Green? Four. Councillor Lott? Four. Councillor Richardson? Four. Councillor Samuel? Four. Councillor Wheatman? Four. It's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much for that. Um, can we now move to item nine? which is a, a report discretionary approach to enforcement on construction hours. Uh, this is a, a late item, but it is an urgent item of business, which I've agreed to, to being added to the agenda. You've all received a copy of the uh, report, I hope. Can I ask Jackie Palmer now to introduce it? Thank you, Chair. Yes. Um, the, uh, there was a written ministerial statement which was published on the 13th of May, um, which indicated that the government um, effectively expects local authorities to be um, more lenient with uh, their enforcement activity in relation to managing the time during which construction sites would operate. Um, the indication from government is that we should be allowing construction sites to work until at least 9pm unless there are very good reasons why they should not work. Um, during those times and that's essentially to allow the construction um, operators to more effectively stagger the times at which their workforce um, attend the site uh, so that they are able to comply with all the uh, relevant guidance around social distancing. Um, you'll appreciate <coughs> excuse me, 
We normally do impose um, conditions on working hours, restricting working from 8 a.m. in the morning until 6 p.m. at night, um, until 2 p.m. on Saturdays with no working on Sundays or bank holidays. Um, so there would potentially be an extra three hours of evening working um, during the, uh, Monday to Saturday. Um, because we recognise that this is potentially quite a sensitive change in some circumstances where there are noise sensitive properties near two construction sites, and we recognise that it will vary with the stage at which construction work is at. Um, we, did, uh, we have suggested putting in place um, a delegated uh, process whereby um, each request that's received from developers, and we have around three at the moment, um, are basically sort of reviewed on a site by site basis. Um, and that mitigation measures are, are agreed effectively on an informal basis with the developers to ensure that they keep noise during that 6 till 9 p.m. Um, time period to a, a minimum. Um, so, for example, restricting noisy activities like piling to the normal hours. Um, and that on that basis, we would, um, we, would, we would put a report for each site through to the uh, chair and deputy for them to review so that we've got um, a, a clear basis for allowing any um, extension of the working hours. Ultimately, the original condition that requires sites to, to stop working at 6 p.m. would remain in place. So we would have a basis for enforcement if there were breaches um, or if the developers um, were not complying with the informal arrangements that we would have in place. But as I say, the government's starting point is that there have to be very strong reasons um, to, to, um, to not allow that extended working till at least 9 p.m. Um, but hopefully this is a way to make sure that we've looked at each site on its own merits and, and the public are aware on the basis on which we've um, al allowed these requests. The, um, the advice from government would mean that this would only be in place at this time until March 2021 and we would expect to look at each site on its own merits in terms of agreeing how long we believe those extended working hours uh, would be appropriate for, but um, certainly for a few months to allow that compliance with social distancing. So the recommendation is in the papers to agree the delegated process um, to authorise Head of Environment, Housing and Leisure in consultation with the Chair and Deputy Chair to agree those uh, revisions and separately to authorise the Head of Environment, Housing and Leisure to put a process in place to implement that recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, what, what sanctions do we have for builders who abuse um, the agreed and relaxed conditions and also what would be the consequences of this committee not agreeing to this report? Um, in relation to the first question then as I say the, 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 the planning permission that's originally granted with the, the, the condition relating to working hours remains um, extant so we would still be able to enforce against that condition um, where we've enforced against conditions regarding um, construction hours working in the past. We've had one um, case which has led to a successful prosecution with a fine, um, but you'll appreciate that that can, can take time. Um, so it doesn't always resolve the, the, the problem immediately. Um, to some extent, we are just relying on, on working on a goodwill basis with the developers that they will put some informal arrangements in place um, to ensure that the noise is reduced um, during those extended hours. Um, but there are also other pieces of legislation that at this point in time the government hasn't made any amendments to. So, for example, our colleagues in the environmental health team um, could potentially still deal with um, breaches under the um, control of uh, construction sites um, if there were uh, statutory nuisances as are arising from particularly from noise during those extended hours. So we would still have some powers. Um, in answer to your second question, um, I, I'm not sure what the, the position would be. We've got a written ministerial statement that says that we are um, we would be required to give very strong and clear reasons why we weren't allowing um, extended working till 9 p.m. Um, so if we were to um, impose a, a blanket um, sort of a, no extension then that would be in breach of the written ministerial planning consideration um, but I honestly don't know what the the method of, of, of any sort of appeal on that basis would be because this is not a formal application. It's effectively just asking for leniency and enforcement. OK, thank you for that, Jackie. Um, can I invite Councillor Richardson to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, my question thought really is, um, yeah, it makes absolute sense. I understand the rationale. 
Um, and I think the idea of taking it on a case by case basis makes good sense. And my question really is at the top of in, in your information paragraph, you talk about the um, uh, enable construction to modify safe working and social distancing and reduce pressure on public transport. If we're going to look at things on a case by case basis, are those considered a plan to make sure that th those are being taken advantage of and it's not just somebody who wants to take advantage of the, the, the lowering of the restrictions to use a site for longer? Are we going to main, are we going to monitor that they, they are doing safe working and they are reducing pressure on public transport by uh, staggering shifts, for instance? Um, so further on in the report, we've set out um, a list of, of bullet points, um, which are the items that we would like developers to provide information um, to us um, on. And that does include them explaining, um, you know, what, why they need to, to carry out those, um, why they need the additional um, hours um, and how they would, um, what, what activities they would um, plan to give um, Again, it's not a statutory requirement. It's something that we're inviting them to provide to help us, um, you know, can make, make a, their proposals to extend the working hours. Um, and I think, you know, we would continue to monitor sites in the normal way. Um, that is largely um, a reactive service. So if we do get complaints that, that um, you know, people are witnessing um, particular activities being carried out and that would appear not to be in accordance with what we've agreed, then as I say, we, we have that potential to revert back to our enforcement action under the original planning conditions. Um, so I would expect it to work in the way that it does now that, you know, people will draw, they observe. It is difficult for us to, to deal with issues around the social distancing because it's outside of our remit, um, but we can certainly work with, with colleagues within, um, you know, public health and, and the public protection team to make sure that developers are reminded of the, of the requirements around how their workforce should be um, operating on site in terms of maintaining their social distancing. Okay, thank you. Councillor Samuel? Confess at the start of this, this report is probably buried in my unread emails uh, because I haven't had a chance to go through it. Um, but I haven't, so I get the gist of it. But I, so my main concern at this point in time is what are the involvement of elected members? Uh, should there be um, an application to relax such a, um, a suggestion within your own particular ward? Because uh, it does strike me that it would probably work in areas that are not near the residential properties, but it's going to cause all sorts of difficulties because uh, people in residential properties want to go to bed and. Uh, get up in early in the morning and work social distance hours as all. Well. It shouldn't be all round about the construction industry. No, and I appreciate that, that there will be concerns locally, which is why we wanted to introduce a process that at least um, enabled there to be, um, you know, an auditable sort of trail as to how we've um, reached a conclusion in relation to each request that we receive. Um, because the government is suggesting that we ought to be res responding back to developers within 10 days, um, it would be difficult, for example, to bring every uh, request through the, the full planning committee route, hence the suggestion that it was in consultation with chair and deputy chair. Um, and I think at that point we would we would certainly be able to um, make sure that ward councillors were updated as to those sites where that extended uh, working practice have been agreed. Um, but it would be difficult to introduce consultation beyond that because of that 10 day deadline that's been suggested. That does, sorry, if I can come back, that does concern me that um, there'd be little, little chance of input for elected members who are going to get bombarded once the decision is actually made. That's certainly something we could look at in terms of the process. Um, I think if there were a very short turnaround timescale to um, make ward members aware that a, a request had been received for a site within their ward, um, but as I say, because of that 10 day so the turnaround that's been um, suggested by government, we would need to just move forward very quickly with that. But but I, I, I don't think that's impossible to do if, if, if it were a short turnaround. Yeah, I think that if committee does agree to this report, I would like that built into the system so that the ward councillors receive notice. Not in the form of a consultation can we do this, um, in the form of notice saying it is going to be done so that they can um, explain to any residents who might have complaints uh, why it's being done and that we are working in accordance with a request from central government. 
Is that okay, Jackie? Are there any other questions, please? Okay. I've got two people with hands up here, Councillor Richardson and Councillor Samuel. Is this just absent mindedness? I'll move on to Councillor Graham. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this is an eminently pragmatic approach to the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, when I first started, I thought it would only be on to the end of British summer time um, while light allowed working. But I'm just thinking about light pollution and flood lighting on sites and how that might impact on on local people. So um, obviously there will be a mechanism to deal with that on an individual basis. Is that correct? Um, that's a very good point. I think we sort of envisaged initially that we would perhaps give the extension um, for uh, over, over the summer period, so maybe the three to four months. So I think um, the, the issues that arise in terms of working till 9 p.m. potentially all the way through to March, um, we would try to, to deal with it at a later date. But we can certainly we could add that into the, the, the list of requirements um, where um, that working extends into um, you know periods where it will be dark. I mean, obviously times of the year, even when when they're working till six o'clock, that they have to deal with that. But uh, it's just it's just that concern, isn't it, around added nuisance if they've got, for example, floodlights near to residential properties. So we can add that into the list of information on which we would like guidance. But I think we envisage an initial, um, perhaps a three months to to allow that extended working and then review. So we could pick that up at the point we review these. Thank you, Sandra. Um... I think that was a very good point. And thanks, Jackie, for your responses. Nobody else is indicating, so um, I think you all have the recommendation in front of you. Can I ask the clerk to go through the roll call um, and ask you to indicate whether you agree or don't agree, please? This is for or against the re officer recommendation. Councillor Barry? Oh. Councillor Brady. Oh. Councillor Burdis. Oh. Councillor Dark. Oh. Councillor Graham. Oh. Councillor Green. Oh. Councillor Lott. Oh. Councillor Richardson. Oh. Councillor Samuel. Oh. And Councillor Wheatman. Four. Unanimous again, Chair. Right, thank you all for that. Um, that's agreed. That also concludes today's meeting of the Planning Committee. So can I thank you all for your participation and can I thank um, and say goodbye to all of our YouTube followers. I'd however like to ask members of the committee that are still in attendance, if the, you have any observations about the way the meeting is conducted today, how it's progressed, um, constructive, hopefully, please. Could you send them all to Michael, who can collate? If you've got any ideas as to how we can improve on this model, because clearly this is the first one. I've found it to be quite exhausting, actually, um, especially when you get cut off just as you're about to open the meeting. But if we could all contribute to that, I'd be grateful. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Thank you.